Hello Canadian gardeners, cold climate gardeners, and gardeners of the extremes. How are you guys doing today? If you guys are new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, we take that science and we apply it to all things gardening and plant care. So if you like the sounds, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. Give this video a thumbs up and join our awesome crew because everyone here is great. So on today's video, we are going to be talking about powdery mildew. And as always, it's not going to be a simple cut and dry video on how to get rid of it. We're going to be going through exactly what powdery mildew is, how it affects the plant. Is it bad or is it okay? And then exactly how you can get rid of it, but also how you can prevent it from showing up in your garden year after year, because there is a method to stop this from being your friendly neighbor. My only plant I have this on and I literally just got hit with it about a week ago is my spaghetti squash. And it seems like every year my spaghetti squash gets a little bit of powdery mildew on it. And so I'll actually show you my spaghetti squash and show you some footage of exactly what that looks like and uh, kind of some unique characteristics you can look for in your plants at home if you have a bit of powdery mildew on uh, gracing you with its presence because it's a fun guy to hang around with. I am a woman that says dad jokes. It's kind of bad, but it's true. So what is powdery mildew? Well, it's, it's fungi. There is actually not just one form of this. There's actually different types and the different types depends on exactly who the host plant is, depends on what type is going to survive in your garden year after year. Um, the type of powdery mildew you have is actually specially engineered to be able to survive on your host plant, whether that be zucchini, cucumber, squash, pumpkin, etc., so forth. There's so many things, it could be roses, um, there's different types of legumes that it's been kind of designed to attack. So it completely depends on the host plant as to what type of powdery mildew you have in your presence. So the most common one, which is the ones that you see on more of the vining plants is the, I'm gonna butcher this, but the Theria xani, xanathi, xanathi, xanathi. I don't speak Latin. Turns out I'm not possessed by uh, a Latin demon, so I'm not very good at pronouncing Latin names. Um, it's kind of my shortfall, but it is also known as Sephiricana fungi, which is like the AKA for it, but it, it's powdery mildew. All powdery mildews act the exact same. They come on with the exact same intensity and they remove the exact same way. So for all intents and purposes of this video, when I say powdery mildew, I'm not referring to any one in specific and all treatments and preventative measures apply to all types of powdery mildew fungi, regardless of its genus, species, family, blah. So when it first appears, you're going to notice spots on your leaves and the spots can typically be removed. They kind of look like dust, but as the powdery mildew progresses on the leaf, the blotches get larger and bigger and the density or the darkness of the spot as it increases is actually just a sign of more spores forming on that area. You typically can actually remove um, the fungus with your finger and what you're removing isn't necessarily the fungi spores itself, but you're actually removing kind of the hyphae, which is um, like a netting material that holds the mycatas nuts down. If you chew on that Diffenbachia, <gasps> 12 seconds later. So that hyphae actually will help mat and kind of set those spores in place. And that is actually what attaches it to the leaf of the plant, if you will. You're also gonna notice typically with the splotches is that the top splotches don't match the bottom splotches. So that means um, while it may look like it's through the leaf entirely, it's not. You have a different colony on top and a different colony on the bottom. And if you actually look at a leaf, you'll notice that the splotches don't line up, whether that is in shape or size or just the density is a little bit different. I find in my experience that a majority of powdery mildew tends to reside on the older leaves. Um, they tend to be the most susceptible. For some reason, I never 
never, I rarely see it um, starting on the newer leaves. It'll eventually progress to that point, but just initially starting out, it, I've never seen it on the newer leaves. It's always the older set. So how does it happen? Well, it's actually gonna surprise you exactly how this fungi survives and lives. Fungi is very popularly known as surviving in humid, dark, warm places. Um, but it actually, for powdery mildew, it usually comes around when the conditions are dry, but the air is humid. So let me explain. If it is hot outside, say 30, or high 20s, low 30s degrees Celsius, I'll pop what that is here in Fahrenheit, but if it is around that range in temperature, and then it is raining at night and the humidity ambiently is increasing, but your plant's soil and the foliage of the plant itself is continually dry due to the, the heat from the daytime sun. What ends up happening is it, it's the perfect recipe for powdery mildew to form. So right off the bat, um, a preventative measure that works and has worked for me um, in many different cases for many different varieties of plants. It just doesn't seem to work for spaghetti squash for whatever reason, but um, it's actually watering the leaves and you're not going to burn your leaves if you're concerned about that. I suggest you check out my one what time to water video kind of goes through that myth and exactly why it's incorrect. But the best method is actually to wet the leaves and uh, keep that ambient temperature or the ambient humidity up around the leaves and it will prevent the spores from actually being able to form. Bottom line is the fungus needs a host to survive and the host has to be specifically engineered to that specific type of fungi. So there are actual genetic, genetically modified vegetables that you can purchase that typically are heavily um, susceptible to powdery mildew that have had genes kind of put into it to alter it. And the specific gene resistance is actually the allele M PM3. And that's a whole other topic, uh, plant genetics and things like that. But um, essentially it is uh, an allele that was spliced into certain types of varieties of plants to help them kind of resist powdery mildew if it does end up on its leaves, but not necessarily completely remove. Doesn't completely remove. Some of those genetically resistant varieties will still get powdery mildew if the issue is prevalent enough kind of within the soil and within the dead foliage around the plant. So when it comes to spreading of this, it is actually spread through the same way every fungus is spread and it is through these very odd looking kind of mushroom type organ looking things um, that we can't see to the naked eye in this case. So these uh, fruiting, they're called fruiting bodies, they're called asocarps and inside the asocarp is a C, ASI, a C, a C, A S C I. I can see it from my textbooks in my head how it's spelled, no idea how to pronounce it, but a C. And in those a C are usually in uh, droves. Like there's millions of these usually within the asocarp, asocarp, which is the fruiting body. When the asocarp spores are fully mature, they kind of just poof. And then it just gets transported by very obvious means once it is kind of airborne by wind, um, just animal traffic, insect traffic, that sort of thing. Probably what's happening in your garden is it's being spread by either wind or by bugs. And so very specific bugs. <laughs> um, it's not gonna be spread by a bumblebee, for example, but it will be spread by something like an aphid. So anything that actually attaches to the leaf itself and starts sucking, um, and then goes to another leaf and sucks again, that is going to be the best method of transportation and also the best method for it to kind of harbor down and uh, survive, like be able to take on that host. And the reason being is because that bug is doing a lot of the work for us. Powdery mildew itself doesn't host off the cuticle, 
but it uh, hosts off just the layer just underneath, so the mesophyll. So it needs to be able to get into that mesophyll in some way, shape, or form. Um, and now whether that be through a broken leaf or a scratch in the leaf or through a, an actual bug kind of penetrating that cuticle layer and then starting to chew away at that mesophyll, it's a really good uh, interaction site for the powdery mildew to kind of grab onto and then the hyphae will do the rest of the work for it. So what are the effects on plants? And you can have powdery mildew and still get a crop and not have to worry about it and it not be an issue. Those are possibilities, but um, if you let powdery mildew kind of get away from you, or um, in my case, what I decided to do is I noticed it about a week ago and then I left it. because so I was like, oh, YouTube video. But I, in the meantime, was using water to try to dampen it down and try to control it in that way. And when you get powdery mildew on spaghetti squash, it it, the water trick works for zucchinis. It does work for zucchinis. I've done it. It works. It works for cucumbers. I'm using that right now. My cucumbers are fine. But when it comes to spaghetti squash, for whatever reason, the water trick does not work. And I knew it wasn't going to work because it didn't work last year and didn't work the year before. So what you need to do is you need to you need to use other preventative measures and I'll kind of get into those in a little bit later. But essentially when it comes to the plant itself, it uh, eventually makes kind of the plant leaves very brittle and almost dried out in a sense. And that is because of the matting effect of the hyphae. Um, once that hyphae noodles out and kind of covers the whole leaf, very obvious um, processes are stopped. So first of all, the top of the leaf, you're going to have reduced photosynthesis. On the bottom of the leaf, you're obviously going to have reduced respiration because your guard cells and your stomatas will be blocked by kind of dense foliage of the hyphae or dense uh, groupings of the hyphae. So that's going to kind of dampen the, the respiration process. Um, just natural gas exchange, things of that nature. And so you're not going to have as much energy and you're not going to have as much transport um, within those leaves. And eventually that's not going to be able to support the fruiting bodies or the flowers that need to take place. So overall, it's going to drastically reduce your production of that crop and you're going to want to get in there and you're going to want to get rid of it. So how do you get rid of it? The main methods for removing this stuff, both at the site when it's happening, but also in the future to prevent it, um, you have two options. You want to drown it out or you want to dry it out. That's like your two, you drown it or you dry it. Typically, and in my experience, is an alcohol-based removal of the actual powdery mildew. So when I say alcohol-based, I literally mean uh, mouthwash for example, would work very well. Rubbing alcohol would work very well. And then obviously store-bought uh, versions of powdery mildew control, which again will have some sort of alcohol in it, some kind of drying agent. Now, your plant is already under a lot of stress. You're about to add alcohol and alcohol is the equivalent of salt. It is very drying. It is going to dry your plant out. So you don't wanna douse your plant in it. Um, you want to spray the affected leaves you want to spray the potentially going to be affected leaves and then you're not going to want to reapply that until you kind of have a better idea. But before you go and you start spraying this, you want to remove the leaves that are toast. Like the ones that are covered in this stuff, you're going to want to remove them because that leaf is no longer any good to the plant and it is literally just harboring those, those spores and those asocarp fruiting bodies on that leaf and you want to remove it because that's just a little hotbed for new powdery mildew to basically form. So you want to remove those and then you want to use an alcohol based um, surfactant on the actual leaf layer itself and you want to spray the top of the leaf and you want to spray the bottom of the leaf. You want to spray both unaffected and affected leaves. So both types. The other method um, is to drown it. And so that would be water. But another option is actually milk. And I know this is crazy. And I didn't talk about this in my plant hack 
uh, series for milk. I never mentioned it um, because I was trying to prove the point that using milk to fertilize is a dumb idea. But to actually use milk as a powdery mildew control actually works very well. Uh, baking soda doesn't. Sodium bicarbonate in any form will not work on powdery mildew. Do not try. It does not work by itself. If it makes you feel better, throw it in with some rubbing alcohol, I guess, or some mouthwash, and then bam, you'll have the results, but it does not work. Sodium bicarbonate does not work. But milk actually has been shown, and even in studies has been shown to work. I personally have not used it, but I looked at some of these papers and exactly what they were detecting, um, and the results would indicate that it did prevent and clear up powdery mildew when it was attacking a plant. Now the study didn't, none of the studies actually got into why, and they're not really sure why this is happening, but they kind of have a theory, and the theory is the protein ferroglobin, which is a type of protein within whey, which is in milk, um, actually releases a chemical. And the chemical is just, it's an oxygen radical is essentially what it is. And it releases it once the milk is exposed to the air and to sunlight. It, uh, pr it basically makes this oxygen radical and it is incredibly harmful to the fungus and the powdery mildew, so it does remove it. Um, like I said, I haven't used it. I don't know how aggressive this is. I don't know how well it works, but uh, the studies I read, it was, it was notable. Like the change was notable. Um, so if you don't want to use mouthwash <laughs> on your plants, uh, milk is an option. And I believe it is straight milk. I not, I don't think you'd be diluting it at all. And it could be powdered form mixed with water or any form. It could be expired milk, really. I mean, if you have stuff laying around that's expired, protein powder probably would work too. Check your protein powder packets and see if it has ferroglobin protein in it. If it has whey protein, it's gonna have ferroglobin. I'm gonna look at that now and I will let you know. I'll put it like right here if it is or not. But protein powder that's expired, that will all work. Now, the most important thing that I think we need to talk about is the actual prevention of powdery mildew and powdery mildew can survive the winter in Canada and it can obviously survive the winters in the United States. But the best method to actually prevent powdery mildew from coming back and kicking your butt every year is to not compost the foliage that has powdery mildew on it. And I believe that is my mistake. So with my spaghetti squash, it's been three years now where I've had powdery mildew and every year it gets worse. But I was composting the healthy parts of the plant which obviously have enough spores in it. And like, I should have known that it had enough. I know that that was a dumb idea, but I still did it. I don't, sometimes I swear, you just kick yourself in your butt with your own logic, but I, that would be your main thing. Um, and so you wanna throw that foliage out or you wanna take that foliage out of your pot or your potting soil or your garden, your raised bed, and you wanna make sure all the foliage is removed completely. You don't want it in the compost and you don't want it as just dead matter because it will survive the winter and it will come every year and kick your butt again. Um, another thing to keep in mind in which I will be doing with my spaghetti squash this year is any plants that are in the relative vicinity of that regardless if they're host plants, I'm just eerie now of them being able to survive kind of on lightly survive on any foliage. Um, and just because if they go dormant, the spores themselves go dormant and the foliage is acting kind of like an insulator on that, that fungus. Um, I worry that it may survive in that too. So the petunia container beside it that you see gone, the sunflower, thing is gone like there's no way I'm going to compost either one of those um so they'll just be going directly into the garbage and be nice don't bring them to the city compost either just throw them out because then you're just going to amplify the issue so um they're gone and that's that's what that's I am I hope you guys enjoyed this video I hope you found it helpful I know it's super in depth it's not like the rest of the powdery mildew videos I watched on YouTube 
and I'm sorry for that, I guess, but it's a science channel, so what do you expect? If you've made it this far, you clearly like this video, so be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and let me know in the comments below what you've had powdery mildew on and how you kicked its butt. I've had it on zucchinis, cucumbers, spaghetti squash. I've never had it on pumpkins. Is that weird? Maybe there, maybe there just isn't that, that strain here, but I have not had it on my pumpkins yet. But yeah, zucchinis I definitely have. The water trick worked for me. I don't know. Let me know if it worked for you. For whatever reason, it worked very well for me. Actually, you know, I should probably mention this too. Um, another preventative measure, like when it comes to seeding, is make sure your plants are spread out enough. So like there's enough distance in between them um, and that you're just pruning. Those are two other things a little bit less important because again it's not the moisture it's not the ambient moisture that's causing it um it's the dryness so maybe it's planting them close together would be a benefit yeah i don't know let me know your thoughts what do you think do you think that would be a benefit it actually might because it would like increase the ambient moisture around the plant itself i don't know it's possible Maybe that's what I should try next year. Okay, I'm rambling. I'm gonna let you guys go. Have an awesome gardening weekend, day, evening, whatever the case is, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye. It's a fun guy. And... <laughs>